which is a multi-site cell. Currently, have 954 live logs um, there, so about five to six million pages per month. Uh, and then we do a lot of customization, whatever. WordPress is about 50% of my job, um, and the rest of it is I do a lot of different things, including Rails development. And I came to behavior-driven development through my work on uh, various Rails projects that were developing in house. And I just wanted to ask a question to start off. Um, how many people are familiar with testing frameworks or automated testing frameworks? Great. Um, browser automation? Oh, okay, cool. And then uh, behavior-driven development? Excellent. So this is going to be good. So, um, DDD is the, so behavior driven development, I'm not going to be saying that hopefully, uh, is the logical successor to test driven development, um, where the idea behind it is you write the test first, and then you write the code that makes the test succeed. So with test driven development, you would encode very specifically all of the parts that make up your application and the objects in your application first, and then you would write tests. To, I'm sorry, you would write the test and then you would write the code afterwards. So test driven development is much more minute. Behavior driven development is like test driven development but at a much higher level. In behavior driven development, what you do is you define your app, the actors in the app, and the things that they're able to do and then the expected results after they do those things. And this will be more apparent when we get to the features. So it's outside in, meaning you focus on the external interface that your users are using first. And because you're focusing on the external stuff and you're not in the guts, you know, working as your primary thing, you know, trying to optimize specific methods or whatever, you're starting from the outside in. Theoretically, this can deliver more business value to your clients because you're working on stuff that matters to them, what they see, what they interact with. So it's kind of a shift in the focus on where you start. Um, in EDD, you use stories to describe, you know, the behavior and create these testing scenarios that both walk through. And then I'm going to demonstrate using uh, Ruby's Cucumber framework to automate the testing of a WordPress plugin. Um, but there are behavior-driven frameworks uh, for PHP that I have experience with, but the hat looks like it's a pretty close match for what Cucumber implements. So um, I want to apologize. This is a fairly experimental topic. Um, I know there is testing testing frameworks, but I'm kind of like gluing together two different things I'm using and fascinated with. So um, let's look at well, okay, let's talk about why. So one of them is you know quality, obviously. Um, we want to ensure that the stuff that we write does what it says on the can, and the only way that we can do that is by testing. And we can do testing like our own thing. We sit there and we try to remember a scenario in our head that we go through, or we can actually encode these testing scenarios and be able to run them over and over again on multiple platforms and on multiple browsers. And that's what EDD allows you to do with an automated testing framework. And then it's free insurance that bandy around and then if you're not testing you're doing it in production no matter what someone's going to find your bugs um, and then i'm sure everybody has done it you make a change that breaks something that you weren't even thinking was even involved this if you have a good set of test coverage allows you to minimize those types of issues because you know when something's going to fail and then just being able to automate a browser um, do a whole set of tasks is a really handy skill to have in your toolbox. It's, it's useful in many different ways. So, an intro to Cucumber, uh, Capybara, and Selenium. So, Cucumber is a framework that allows for the execution of these plain text stories that I'll get to next. Capybara can use multiple drivers to actually run these tests. One of them is Selenium, which interfaces with various browsers to automate them and get data from the browser. The neat thing about using a real browser is you can run Ajax events, you can interact with the DOM, you can hover, you can click, um, all with a real browser. 
And the neat thing about this is none of this is language for location specific. Selenium can just can tell it what domain to point at. It can be Google if you want it to run some automated testing scenarios against Google on a website. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's why this is so you know, possible to do with WordPress. So, some sample stories. I hope this is easy to remove. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, so, this is an actual testable scenario, and I hope you can hear that. But, so, this defines the feature. So, for a plugin, I want an administrator to be able to activate and manage plugin options. And so, in the scenario, this is where we get to the stuff that can actually be interpreted. This is the domain specific language. So, I want to activate the plugin without errors. I wrote some magic behind the covers to make that happen in the WordPress um, install. Given a deactivated plugin in the row with the ID, your plugin name. So this will then navigate to that page, find that activate link, and make sure that it's activated. And a login user type administrator, so an administrator with login. When I visit that page and I click activate, then I can see that it's activated. And so the nice thing about this is if your plugin fails to activate with some change you made, you know, you run this test and then you get the result and it fails. Um, and then this is a much more complicated scenario. But basically what I want to show you is you can use, write these things so that they're reusable. So I fill in fathom height, which is a field name, with 650. And then I'm using it again right here. I fill in fathom width. This phrase right here is reusable. I fill in field name with value. That's reusable. I don't have to write that every single time. Um, so then I do all of that, and I press, this is what you use when you interact with the button, I press the button, and then I'm making sure that my values are carried through the options screen. Um, nice. uh, screen. So, all right. So installation, this assumes that you're running Ruby. It's really not that difficult if you're not familiar with Ruby. Um, this is, uh, you know, these are your instructions on Linux. I don't think this works on Windows. Sorry. Um, so you just install RDF, you install Bundler, and then I have a gem file that basically says all the dependencies to get this working on a Linux machine that you can just install. And it works on OS X because Ruby is, you know, everybody that develops on Ruby is on OS X. Um, so, any questions? Alright, so what I want to do now is run a couple of these uh, scenarios so you can kind of see how it works. So up here, this scenario, the activate scenario, I want to activate the plugin without errors, given blah blah blah, a whole bunch of stuff. So given the deactivated plugin with the ID, that's the plugin we're managing, and a login user, when I visit this, and I click act activate, then I can see that it got activated, right? Now what I'm going to do is actually run that scenario. So you're going to see this start to bootstrap, activate the plugin without errors, it's spinning up the browser, it's going to log in. So I told it I want to deactivate. I want to start from a deactivate scene. So this is now going to go, it just deactivated that. Then it logs out, because that's part of the step that I wrote. Now it's going to log back in. It's going to navigate to that page, it's going to click that activate link, and then it looks for that plugin activated. And so what this told me was all of these scenarios were successful and it worked. Now if I did something to break this, it would throw up a big red warning error and say, fix it, suffer. So um, another one that actually fills in, let me see. So go ahead. Where, where did you tell it about logging in and out? I will show you that right now if you want to see that. Um, so the way that it works is this is a domain specific language. This is a language made specifically for testing. Um, examples of some other domain specific languages would be if you've ever used the OpenBSD uh, packet open PF, that's a domain specific language for managing text elements. Domain specific languages allow you to write a language and an interpreter, and an, an interpreter is written around that domain specific language to do things like this. 
that's why it looks so clean. Someone took the effort to define this DSL which is more secure in a way. Uh, so let me find, so this right here, this is including the Capybara DSL, the, the main specific language for this type of automation. And it's saying, when I visit, quote, a page, do a page. And then this right here, visits a page, is the thing that actually goes out and browses to that page. So all of these steps, when I add a new step, I'll show you that in a second, it'll say, I don't know what you want. And it'll actually give you a framework to define where it is you want to go. Um, so I'll run another one that's a little more complicated. I'm going to run this options scenario here. And this is the one that does something similar to what I showed before. It goes, it builds with some options, and then double checks that the options get set to say um, correctly. So sorry. I'm going to run this. So now, the thing about these features is you have to kind of assume a state of your environment. You want them to be able to run independently. So that's why I'm setting this up, making sure it's activated, um, you know, making sure the, plug, the plugin is activated, because I need to start from the same state to be able to test authoritatively. So I just activated the plugin and make sure that it was activated. Now it's going to log in, navigate to the options page, it's going to change those values, to make sure, so I'm not going to change here, sorry, but trust me, save change. Um, saved options, and now that all succeeded, and everything's green. So, um, so that's a scenario that we go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, where, I, I'm a little confused, but how does it know, like, what, um, what the domain is that you're using, and like, what the admin like so, somewhere. yep, there's actually, and I won't show that because it's, but you can configure that um, in a location just called support, um, and you can say, this is my default domain. Right now, this is just pointing out a local okay. dev instance. Um, and you can also configure what testing framework you want to use to automate the browser or what browser you want to use. So I'm using this against Firefox, but you can do it against Chrome. And then the other thing you can do is against Chrome ID. Um, so, yeah, that's all configurable. And actually, what I want to do is extract this, add a framework, check it into GitHub, and then you will be able to take this and write your own definitions and test your own programs. Yeah, it seems like you probably did a lot of work to make this work well with WordPress and logging in and having stuff. But you, you did that yourself. Um, well, I interacted with the I just use the DSL tool, and then I use Firebug to figure out what elements specifically I wanted to interact with. So it was using Firebug and understanding some of the like our DSL to make that work. Um, and then the only other tricky thing I did here is I have a work, I set up a WordPress admin admin to the username and password, and then I'm just using that to point at so I have my own local. But this could easily be a remote dev instance, doesn't matter. Um, and my plan at some point is to actually just take a SQL dump, dump it, load it, and then run the test. Uh, well, it's pretty awesome. Um, can you, so if you like spoof, you can set like user agent is fine or whatever, and uh, like set the size of the window to your content, like you like to touch the button, but you simulate like the touch of the Or um, I didn't hear that last part. I'm sorry. Do you simulate like the touch of um, I don't know if this would work testing against a mobile device, but you can definitely simulate um, pretty much any event you want to within a browser. I just think you need a, dri a driver that interacts with a mobile browser to see that. I don't know how that would work. I don't know if it's um, Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just simulate the workflow, and this is like the live demo for the dangerous part. Um, so I've written this plugin. Actually, this um, this plugin is what is creating the selection. So I made this. Let's say I made this for some random client. They want me to make a way for them to be able to tweak the default font size. So I'm just going to do this in the most stupid.
stupid way, I'm just going to write out CSS directives into the template, which we can call contest. So now the way that this works, again, is you write the test first, you see the test fail, then you write the code to make the test succeed. So I'm going to go to my feature right here, and this is the scenario that I've written. So an admin should be able to change the default font size. So given an activated plugin and a logged in administrator, I can rewrite the DSL like that. I did. When I visit the options page and I fill in the fathom body font size 37 and I press update option, then it should show that it was 37 pixels. And when I visit a slideshow, an actual like slideshow, I want it to tell me that it's the, the font size of 37. So I'm going to run this. Um, so I'm telling it to run a tag of work camp because I tag this scenario with the work camp tag. And so you can tag these things and run only the things that you're working on. Um, so now this is going to log in and make sure it's enabled. And then one thing we'll see that's different going to fail, so I'm going to watch how many C when it fails. So green was able to activate it, able to log in, was able to go to that page. Oh no. So up here it's saying, and I fill in fathom body text, you know, fathom body font size of 37, it's saying I can't fill it in, it's not there. So this is the test that failed. So now I'm going to what's the new joke I'm going to reach into the magic code. And uh, sorry, it, it's like a rule that you can't type in before. Very painful rule. Right. So now, when I rerun the scenario. So 
by putting this into a feature, I forced myself just in a standard way to go to all the places I need to go, which is obviously. Okay, so that just got through, was able to update it. Now this failed. It says, okay, that doesn't work. It's not in the DOM. It's saying the default box, slide body concept. No, we're looking for it. Look next. So now I'm going to go and actually make that happen. So now here I'm just taking that option that I saved and I'm echoing it out into the template. And now this will go all the way through. I hope. So the idea is fail, succeed, fail, succeed. And you just keep going in that cycle. And now, as you can see, because all of this is defined, um, you know, all of these tests and all of the attributes that need to be set is defined. I can then run this as many times as I want um, and ensure that there's a high level of quality in the, the plugin that I'm running. So, let's see. Why would you, what would you say, could you describe what we could do with Selenium with 
of these other tools and why we should incorporate it with the other tools as well. Um, I've mostly used Selenium through Cucumber, through this automated testing. So I, I honestly can't tell you what it does on its own. Um, but the neat thing about that install process I showed you is Selenium is native in Java. Um, installing a Selenium gem gets all of the Selenium requirements for you. So that five step thing on a Linux machine is about all you need to get started with this stuff. I don't know how this is going to work out. Behind Jared? You know, there's a communication uh, parser for the people or just feature That's the install of the set of the that you already said that was your communication here. That is what B hat is. Okay. Yeah, B hat interprets the Gherkin language and from what I saw, not a huge number of differences from um, you know from the Ruby implementation. And then in the Ruby community, there's actually a place for people sharing their step definitions and their scenarios. Um, there's a lot of thought about how we're kind of stuff. So uh, back there. Sure. Um, so one question about the uh, notion of behavior-driven development. So with task-driven development, you're all in the domain of developers. But what's your Behavior with driven development. All of a sudden, you're touching, you know, UX people and other sort of folks that are, you know, not just writing the application, but designing it and changing things on the fly. And, you know, uh, and so how how would you handle those sort of situations? I mean, for regression testing, uh, selenium and stuff like that works really really well. But for sort of that iterative design phase, it. it it's tricky. Right, that's why one of the challenges I put up was need space engineering, because this does require working with a team of people, because this is more about this is more about what people see and interact with. I mean my hope is you write this feature to part of some of your stakeholders are your UX team and the client itself, but I'm not having magic answers for that. Maybe I'm not getting Yeah, I mean the, the design process is the one where things are going to change. And I mean, perhaps quite dramatically, where all of your tests have to be rewritten, and the overhead of having to write those tests as it as that's iterating, uh, that's heavy. Well, hopefully, you can agree on a set of common DOM elements and then use CSS to style those. Um, so you know, you interact with the DSL very heavily just through IDs, CSS selectors, and it, it can use XPath and jQuery like iterators and several other things to test. So if you're, you know, maybe you make a contract with your designer that they're very careful about changing, you know, the DOM, but they have full range of CSS. I don't, I don't know what your, you know, how that would work. I'm there. You can rewrite your feature for generically to write a fix and then you don't make change steps. That was actually one of the points I was getting at with the font size of 37 pixels. Because that's abstracted what that test actually needs, I can rewrite that to actually look at the DOM and parse that 37 pixels up. So you could have a step that's like, and the background uses our blue default font gradient, so whatever, the blue gradient. Um, and you can change what that means too. I, I don't know. It's up to multiple, it is used multiple times. It's right now. Right. Sometimes with uh, test-driven development, sometimes with test-driven development, I kind of feel like I'm falling down the rabbit hole and creating tests. Like, um, you know, some people say you should every line of code should have a test associated with it, and sometimes that's multiple lines of tests or like a numeric value inside of a range. So, um, I mean, do you have any words about that? You know, do you, do you strive for 100%? Code coverage with your tests, and I you know that's you know, it would be nice, but um. yeah, it would be nice. I don't have any thoughts about that. I mean, I I'm constantly in a state where people are screaming for a project to be done, and I want to do it right. So you know, I it's a balance you have to strike. Um, there's nowhere near that you can ever have 100 percent code coverage, but. Um, one nice thing about behavior-driven development is the higher you function, the more productive you can be as a developer. And with behavior-driven development, you're able to function at a very high level. 
um, rather than if you've written like unit tests and you're exercising every method in an object that's really very tedious. Whereas with this, so the thing is, the reason I said theoretically you get more value is obviously your back end needs to be stable and performance um, for your front end to be usable as well. So the way that in the Ruby community a lot of people complement the native development is with unit tests on the models uh, via our spec. And then um, you know, behavior driven development with higher level stuff. Um, but it can be hard sometimes to justify the time spent on test driven development. But the idea behind this too is that this is your workflow. This is how you do it. You write the test and then you write the code right after the test. So it's it's different. It's a different way. I'm not sure that it takes all that much more time. It does, but um, you know, it's a different workflow. But you don't have to think about the tests every time you do. Then it is you don't forget to do testing. You don't forget to do tests. Because testing afterwards is kind of, yeah. Uh, Does, does that DSL support uh, like Ajax events? Like, can you tell it to do yes. something and then wait for like a, a demo night to appear? Yeah, actually have a scenario that we can look at real quick that um, exercises Ajax events to figure out. Okay, so this right here, this scenario goes to a, the slide custom type. So it says, when I, I'm an editor, I'm a logic user that's an editor. I visit the edit tags page and I'm adding a new slide. Right here, I click add button HTML. What that does, that's the ID for the HTML editor in the wizard. And so that's just a click event. It's not actually going to a to an element. And then I'm filling this in because I can figure out how to get a tiny and CD to set the content. So I can run this uh, scenario as well and it should. I'm lucky. So this one was tagged with editors. Um, when an editor acts a slide, it should appear in it should appear in the slide or that's that word. So now this is going to make sure it's activated. Because again, these things need to start from a clean slate. But you can't have your previous test implementing the latest test. So this is going to activate it, log out. Now it's going to fill in, log in as an editor. So now it's going to go to the new. Oh, so this is adding actually a custom taxonomy value, remembering that custom taxonomy value, going back to the slide add page. It's going to put in some content, put in the custom taxonomy, taxonomy value that it just added, and now it just published and it's viewing the slide. So all of that tested adding a slide um, in a custom post type adding a taxonomy value, and I wrote some tests that said, so, let's see, I fill in, so I go to this taxonomy, custom taxonomy page, I fill in with a random value, I go to the post page, I fill, I'm sorry, I fill in the title, I activate the WYSIWYG, I fill in the content, and then I fill in the slideshow taxonomy field with a random value like this. Pretty awesome. And then that um, feature is, I'm sorry, that's a step. Okay. I think it's actually started. So I filled in some random field name that I parsed out with a random value. Where I create the random value. I should see the random value I just used. WordPress content error unless it has the random value that I created up here. This is how I interact with field. Fill in field with random value. Um, and then fill in, that's the name of the thing of the uh, form field on the new post tag that accepts the taxonomy value. With the value. So. 
I'm curious, how long does it take you to write your, your login um, script? Uh, or is this called a feature? Is it displaying the code? I already wrote it. So, oh, so how long did it take you to write that part before this? You know, like, are we talking like an hour, a day, or what? Um, not long. I would say uh, 20 minutes. Okay. And then do you have to uh, kind of keep up this part, too? Um, yeah. Periodically, yeah. I mean, as you can see. As you can see from the console, the error messages are relatively good. They're not perfect, but um, they're pretty good. Um, I wanted to see if, uh, let's see. So I made a, um, a set definition called user off. And this is the thing that gateway is those. So this says, when it's subscribers, I want to test subscriber user. I visit the login page, I fill in username with test subscriber, password with test subscriber, click button login. And then I check the how do you test subscriber does it, um, to ensure that I'm actually logged in. So this, I just had to figure out the point of this. It's really what it came down to and how to address it properly. And then my, the idea behind the framework is that I would, you know, we could extract this, a bunch of common tasks and then that's a shared library of these interactions that you can use to test for. So you theoretically would have to write this. Yeah. Sorry, you can give us a starting database or anything more. Right, that's, or create a task that would say, create a default yeah. Yeah. site and create all the sessions and that kind of message. Yeah, and it would fill that stuff in for you. So, any other questions? So this is going to um, create a custom taxonomy value, create a slide, associate the custom taxonomy value with that slide, and then test that the slide is created properly, and then visit the page and make sure that it's there. It's going to walk the goals.